Hi, this is Ron Espino, and you're listening to Retrospectives with John Broughton on Casey Radio 97.7 FM. So, um, how's life without Died Pretty been, been treating you so far? Uh, fine, yeah. It's uh, just sort of coasting along. Uh, yeah, it's been a year now. It's been over a year since we did our final show here in Melbourne. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just sort of coasting along and, um, yeah, sort of basically getting used to Melbourne now. Like, I've been here for a year, so I've just been sort of settling into Melbourne. That's been my main sort of um, concern. So, and what inspired that move? My son lives here, so oh, okay. uh, he started school last year, at the beginning of last year, so I wanted to move down and sort of be closer to him. Excellent. He lives out at Bayside with his mum, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I'm here at South Yarra, so uh, yeah, he come, I see him every weekend, so um, yeah, just to be closer to him basically, and uh, sort of guide him as best I can through uh, these years, uh, and uh, he's uh, starting uh, grade one, I think, this year. In a few weeks' time, he starts grade one, which is very very proud of <laughs> mm, so I just uh, yeah that's just been my main sort of uh, concern is just settling in here and uh, being close to my son sort of uh, bonding with him I believe you've always had a bit of a soft spot for Melbourne anyway love Melbourne always yeah. have done ever since we came here in uh, about 1985 or something I think was our first trek to Melbourne uh, the Prince of Wales uh, the first show was at the Prince of Wales I think and uh, yeah I've, I've always loved it uh, in Melbourne yeah I always love coming back here, always made some great friends, just uh, something about the place that's got a nice atmosphere to it. And uh, uh, and settling here in the past year has just been great. It's been a bit sort of lonely, but, um, you know, because I don't know that many people, in, apart from people in bands, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the music scene. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's been sort of, um, yeah, a bit lonely, but uh, it's fine. So, so with the bank, could you, could you see the end coming for a while? Was it? Um... Oh, I think uh, most people thought we'd split up about ten years ago, but we just, you know, uh, probably too lazy to actually put it into. <laughs> we're all too lazy to actually just pull the plug. No, you pull it. No, you. No, you. I don't want to. Um, I can't be bothered. <laughs> Let's do another album instead. Okay, fine. That's much easier. Uh, so I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of the reaction was, well, gee, I thought they'd split up about ten years ago because our our playing was like. We played about three times a year towards the last few years. We were playing just sort of getting older and just uh, just not having that same enthusiasm for, like, you know, doing the track around Australia, you know, and uh, <laughs> playing, you know, every weekend and stuff. We just wanted to go back to how we originally played. It was to to always just make it a special sort of um, uh, performance every time we performed. Yeah. That's meaning we could only perform two or three times a year. Um, and so, yeah, we sort of were semi split up anyhow I guess for the last half a dozen years so it was just a matter of somebody either myself or Brett just saying look let's let's do this let's pull the plug and make so, it official mm, yeah. mm. but uh, I'd, look to a lot of people it didn't come as a great surprise I don't <laughs> think and the world's still spinning you know <laughs> it's not uh, it's no big deal you certainly did taper off the, the touring in those last few years mm, so mm. it wasn't so much for economic reasons it was just uh, becoming less enjoyable I think so, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've sort of got other priorities, and, and you know, I don't know. It's just, uh, yeah, just that sort of it becomes a bit boring after a while, you know. Um, just that whole sort of uh, performance, you know, backstage rider sort of cycle, you know. It's like, uh, you know, hotel room, hotel room to stage to backstage to rider to back to hotel, yeah. uh, and then back into a van, and then back on the road, and then back onto a plane, and. It's like, um, yeah, sort of boring after a while. <laughs> after, you know, 15 years of it or something. Going back to the beginning, was there a blueprint for the, the sound that, that you wanted for Die Pretty? What was it? What, was there one? Did you have a... No, no, no. I, 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 I was still... When uh, Die Pretty was uh, formed, uh, you know, I, I'd been friends with Brad in Brisbane, so uh, we had uh, our respective bands in Brisbane. I had the 31st, he had the end, and uh, that's how we sort of palled up, and we, we found that we had a band called the New York Dolls in common. Uh, so we both loved that, and he sort of introduced me to a lot of the Velvet Underground stuff. I'd, I'd known of Lou Reed, but I wasn't overly familiar with the Velvet Underground, so um, he sort of introduced me to a lot of that. We both loved um, <clears throat> that sort of whole 70s 
70s CBGB's, uh, you know, Patti Smith television, Tom Verlaine's television, the Ramones, all that sort of New York sort of sound. Look, we loved all those sort of bands, so we had that. And then when we, uh, you know, the end relocated to Sydney, I followed them down to Sydney. We sort of teamed up, palled up again. I tried to get join the end and said, Brett, the end needs a lead singer. <laughs> and he was <laughs> like, no, the end is my band. Um, I'm going to sing, and, and uh, sort of the end fell apart, and then we just uh, we just got together uh, with a, a journalist friend of ours at the time who was writing for a magazine called Ram Magazine at the time. Frank Brunetti played keyboards, um, or just purchased a set of keyboards and started playing them, basically. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, yeah, and just uh, the three of us, that was the sort of nucleus of... Uh, uh, Frank actually suggested to Brett that he, he uh, that uh, Brett have a chat to me about doing vocals. So it was the two of them, and then they got sort of roped me in, and uh, so that was the nucleus of Died Pretty. Basically, it was myself, Brett, and Frank. And uh, I guess Brett, you know, brought his influences. I was still hanging on to a lot of that Radio Birdman, Stooges sort of thing too. Mm. Um, that sort of 60s, sort of 70s, uh, Radio Birdman, Stooges, Blue Oyster Cult, that sort of end of the scale also that sort of Brett wasn't overly into at the time, uh, apart from the Stooges, but I had that sort of whole, you know, Radio Birdman thing. Yeah. I was quite obsessed with that Radio Birdman um, whole sort of thing. Speaking right. of the Stooges, you, you received a lot of uh, Iggy Pop comparisons. Uh, that is isn't it? <laughs> <in those. laughs> Did that sit okay with you at the time? Oh, I I guess so, yeah. I, I'd never seen the guy perform, so I don't know how they could compare. You know, I'd never seen him perform. I'd seen still photographs of, of you know, the Stooges in 1969 or something with him sort of covered in glitter and peanut butter and bleeding and, you know, looking very wild. It wasn't until many years, many years later that I actually saw a documentary on the Stooges. I think it was on SBS or something. I actually saw it overseas for the first time when we were touring Europe. I saw it in Holland or France or somewhere. And it was this documentary on the Stooges and, my God, what a documentary. I saw it in about like, the mid-80s or the late 80s uh, in Europe and uh, I think it, they finally showed it out here on SBS, I think, a few years ago. But it was just like the Stooges. It was like live concert footage from like 1968 and 1969. Yeah. He's a good little mover, that's for sure. <laughs> He could dance, that's for sure. Um, just a, an amazing performer, really, uh, Just yeah, and, and still is, I think. Yeah. Bit craggy looking these days, God love him, but um, <laughs> aren't we all? Absolutely. Mm, mm. Any, any significance to how the name came to be? Died Pretty? Died Pretty Died. No, it's just a name that I was li li living in Brisbane, and I just come up with those. I had a day of making up silly band names, and that was one of them, and, you know, there was the Speaking Clock, the Watch Below, <laughs> you know, the, the Died Pretty, uh, you know. Basically, you know, a few years later, you know, uh, when we were in, I was in Sydney, we needed a name, and uh, Final Solution didn't sort of, we didn't think we'd go too far with Final Solution. <laughs> <laughs> didn't have that sort of happy ring to it, really. Yeah. That uh, successful ring to it, Final Solution. So we did one show as Final Solution and then quickly changed it to Died Pretty. So, mm. But there's, there's nothing, not really, no. It's just a play on words, I guess. Yeah. Just, um, I don't know, just something I made up, and I've never liked the name myself, I must be honest. Never liked Died Pretty as a name. Really? Mm -mm, no, <laughs> no, I was very disappointed when I got outvoted. I, I did a lot of stamping of feet and stuff. <laughs> um, but uh, I was, as I said, I was outvoted, so, and we needed a name very quickly, so. But then I thought, like, Died Pretty probably won't last long anyhow, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I can always change it to something else, because Died Pretty won't last long, so. Little did you know. Uh, yes, it would be 20 years later. Well, I only ever wanted to do one single. I was quite happy to do Out of the Unknown as a single. And then uh, Brett still tells me, you know, he said, I remember when we recorded that, you never wanted to do anything. I'd left my mark in, in a seven-inch single. That's all I ever wanted to do. And, of course, the next minute I was doing an EP and then an album and sort of snowball from there. I was like, what? <laughs> I only wanted to do a seven-inch single. How did the um, the songwriting procedure with you and Brett work? Did it say the same all the way through? Yeah, basically, yeah. Just he, he and I, uh, uh, you know. Obviously, it just uh, uh, just sort of um, we had some sort of little magical thing that just sort of um, clicked when we got together. You know, he would strum and I would sing, and everything would fall into place. Or I would sing and he would strum, and and uh, and uh, out of all the band members, he and I were the ones that obviously, you know, the old cliched, uh, you know, guitarist and singer of the main songwriters. Yeah. Um, I gave everyone a shot at it, though. Uh, you know, uh, Robbie, I uh, wrote a song with Robbie, and I, I wrote one of our, 
uh, uh, wrote one of our more famous songs, I guess, famous, uh, uh, better known songs, they're not famous, better known songs was DC, and I actually wrote that with Steve Clark, the bass player at the time. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, I wrote um, two of our songs, two of our better known songs, I actually co-wrote with, without Brett. <laughs> so <laughs> DC I co-wrote with Steve Clark, and, and God bless off Doughboy, I, I co-wrote with John, um, John Howey, the keyboard player, so the two, it's sort of weird, and of course Sweetheart I wrote with Brett, but I mean, the two of the better known or m- better loved uh, died pretty songs, or generally popular songs of ours seem to be those two, uh, God Bless and DC, and I never wrote them with Brett. <laughs> Although Brett had quite a bit to do with with the arranging of DC, so he probably should have gotten a credit. The credit, yeah. Uh, but at the time, he sort of waved it away, little knowing that DC would become one of our most m- sort of better better known songs. And at the end, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think he could have have his time over again. It would be a Myers Pino Clark composition. Uh-huh. I think. But uh, as it was at the time, he just went, no, that's no, fine. So, but Brett did have quite a lot to do with that particular song. For you personally, what what point in time or what album do you think the band really really came of age? Oh, probably yeah, the, the Doughboy Hollow, of course. Yeah. I think yeah, yeah. I came out of the rehearsals going. I, I remember, I still remember saying to Brett, sitting on a lounge, going, Brett, it's like we've really matured. <laughs> <laughs> I remember saying we were, we'd matured, just hearing the songs back in there because we were doing a pre-production, and just hearing these songs back, it was just like, wow, there's something. We both knew that there was something sort of happening there. We'd reached a sort of pinnacle or something yeah. in songwriting, and just, I don't know, the songs were really strong. We just turned a corner, and we both knew it, uh, and uh, sort of never recaptured again, really, sort of in bits and pieces, though, in ribs and drabs, but never reached that point again. It was uh, very strange. So did, did not, you do... not that uh, I didn't think the, the albums after that weren't as good. I, I think, you know, one of my favourites albums is uh, one of our later ones called Using My Gills as a Roadmap which was from 1997 and uh, that was where we got sort of a bit electronica and stuff and that's, right. and, uh, that's one of my favourite albums of ours actually I really like that album a lot Did you do anything different in, in the approach to Dub Boy Hollow as you did with the other albums? No, I don't know what happened I just <laughs> think it was the songs just these m- wonderful batch of songs I don't, uh, nothing was no it was just sort of come together, strum, sing, you know, I'll throw a melody in. I just think... It's an amazing batch of songs. Yeah, I just think it was one of those just things that happened, you know. Um, just, yeah, nothing, nothing different at all. Just It was just, I don't know, it's that unexplainable, I guess, that just, uh, um, yeah, just got together and uh, came up with these batch of songs that were just... As I said, even we knew it at the time. We just sort of looked at each other and went, wow, this is, this is really strong stuff that we're coming up with. We've got something here. Yeah, yeah. yes. Unfortunately, it didn't sort of uh, pan out financially, you know. <laughs> if an album was going to do it for us, I think it would have been that, well, like financially and mainstream-wise and all those mm. all those bad words. Um, if, that, if we were going to do anything, yeah. I think the, the record company at the time that had that was... Uh, didn't do a great deal with it. Uh, didn't do as much as they could have, unfortunately. So it sunk. Really. That was just before you went to Sony, wasn't it? Mm, yeah. Mm, I think with Sony that's behind it, a record it, label. It was quite prominent. Yeah. In those days, but uh, uh, the, the managing director or whoever he was at the time just sort of went, ah, "This album's not going to do any good," and we just were broken-hearted because they just didn't do anything with it. So. Of course, when Sony found out, they just went, oh, we wish, I wish Sony could have had that. I wish we could have given the album to Sony. That would have been good. Yeah, that was my <laughs> next would question. Been, would, would, <laughs> things would have been different, a little yeah, different, I think. It might have made the difference. Yeah, so yeah. we never got that shot again, unfortunately. Um, uh, poor old Sony tried with us, but um, they were very good with us and very, um, very, um, very patient with us. <laughs> we, we made all these demands with Sony, this huge, you know, multinational corporation we don't want to do this and we're not appearing on that show and <laughs> we were stipulated we were no way we were appearing on something like hey hey it's saturday because they had sort of links with hey hey it's saturday or something and they're going you know it's just it'll be good if you guys appear on hey hey you know it'll be really good and we're going no <laughs> there's no way on earth that we're appearing we had it written in the contract that we wouldn't be made to appear on hey hey it's saturday oh, right. and they were okay with that 
Mm, mm, mm. They were very good with us, actually. As I said, they were really, really good. I think if we would have played ball a bit more, things might have been a bit... But we were sort of very anti that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted success, but we wanted it... On your own our terms. Way, yeah, yeah. By having to appear on silly TV shows with pink ostriches and stuff, <laughs> you know, uh, which I think every other band in Australia appeared on, didn't they? Oh, for sure, yeah. Uh, and uh, we just couldn't do it. Um, but we did want success. I mean, we're silly. I mean, Brett and I said, look, you know, Sony want to sign us. Let's go for the big one. If this is, Let's see if we can actually do it, you know. Let's see if we can be, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, be really successful. And, of course, we had our moments of success, but nothing like in excess or something like that, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, uh, the, um, yeah. But, um, How did your approach to, to getting overseas recognition? From an outsider's point of view, it would seem that you were, you were pretty slow and steady about it. Yeah, well, I think it was that whole Citadel Aussie rock thing, you know, the the whole sort of independent rock sort of thing with the Citadel up and going and, uh, you know, just, I don't know, it was just this, uh, this half a dozen years over in Europe uh, where we were sort of huge in Italy uh, and we were going over there just y annually. Uh, our, our, our yearly trek, our, 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 you know, we had the, the, the free dirt tour. We had, you know, we released a single called Winterland. We actually toured just on a single. <laughs> we actually toured a Winterland tour of Europe just on one single. single. <laughs> yeah, it was a, 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 it was called the Winterland tour of Europe. It, that was wild. It was just, um, and and uh, you know, being voted in uh, uh, some radio or some magazine in Italy, you know, there was like the three most, you know, popular artists in, the, you know, in, in Italy or something was like Madonna. I think it went like Madonna, Springsteen, then Died Pretty or something like that. It was really very, very strange. We were number three or four or something on this top ten of, you know, most popular <laughs> artists, you know, sandwich in between Prince and Springsteen or something like that, you know, very strange. But that was, uh, I just I just think that was that whole Aussie... The, the the independent rock thing because uh, you know going back there again in the early 90s mm -mm, god it was just totally dance orientated yeah the whole tech that totally unbelievably changed for us jeez you know we couldn't get crowds we couldn't get it nobody's overly interested actually on the i think that was about 1993 was our last tour of uh, europe and it was quite sad it was very depressing we just couldn't do it it was, uh, yeah. It wasn't like it was 1986 or something like that, where we were playing like outdoor bloody parks in in um, Italy and France and these huge uh, venues in in Paris and stuff. And you know, we went back in 1993. We'd been booked into a jazz basement <laughs> in, uh, in in Paris. You know, that the uh, capacity holds like you know 200 or something. It was like, and it was full, thankfully. <laughs> but it was just a real contrast. Yeah. In such and, a short uh, space of time, they, too. They, they just, Europe just went sort of dance crazy, you know, with the advent of techno and doof stuff, I guess. Any um, any album you wish you could go back and do again? Oh, yeah, this is always... I've been told, like, don't say negative things about your work. <laughs> cause I, uh, there was one album that I just won't have anything to do with, but uh, I've been told that, like, people love that album for, for their own reasons, and... And uh, Trace was an album that I just had, uh, I have difficulty with. I wish I could, uh, uh, yeah, I wish I could have, could go back and do that. Or oh, I wish we had the, whereas Doughboy Hollow was in, inspiring songs with Brett and I, we got together for that album, it was just totally the opposite. I just thought they were weak songs. Um, but, uh, I was playing up in the studio, I was sort of going out, you know, just being the party boy yeah. during the because I was so cocky with Hugh um, God I've forgotten his name Hugh uh, or Hugh that did uh, the Doughboy produced Doughboy Hollow uh, he did Trace also and uh, when he came out again I was like oh Hugh will be able to do this you know I was just being a party boy and just you know the vocals were shocking um, uh, I could, couldn't write lyrics for it oh it was horrible there was just I don't know what sort of you know, it was during that time he did that silly Rolling Stone nude thing. Uh, it was, oh, yes. it was horrible. <laughs> it was a bad year, 93, for me. I didn't, didn't like it at all. I sort of, you know, split in a relationship. I did a bloody silly 
you know, nude magazine thing. I don't know. I must have been adult totally or something. I don't know. Um, just totally adult in 1993. Uh, couldn't get it together for Trace at all. Could not get it together, but wasn't interested in Trace. Um, I thought the songs were really weak. I was really disappointed in the songs we came up with for that album and those final songs that were selected. I was so disappointed, really upset. But uh, as, as I said, I, 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 the only thing with Died Pretty, I could have been a bit more assertive in Died Pretty. I could have thumped my fist instead of, you know, tap dancing. <laughs> um, I should have thumped my fist a bit louder. But... Um, um, that's the way it goes. But, I mean, that's only one. I mean, it's, there's some nice things. There's some nice moments on Trace, but uh, as an album, yeah, it doesn't do it for me. Yeah. But, again, you know, various people will go, well, that was your fault because you were acted up on the album. <laughs> you know, you're a naughty boy. And it's like, no, well, the actual songs, if you write, if you talk to the two songwriters, if you speak to Brett, he will actually agree that the songs weren't that powerful, actually. They weren't that great. A batch of songs. It's... You know, we're not geniuses, that's for sure. We're just, you know, a couple of guys in a band. It's not, you know, we're not we're not talking Lennon and McCartney here, that's for sure. But the album did quite well, though, too, didn't it? Isn't it, isn't it weird? Yeah. Uh, our manager said, you wouldn't believe it, it's our biggest selling album. Isn't that weird? <laughs> it's so weird. It's, it, 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 you know, uh, poor old Sony, you know, it's the first album. They signed us up and it's the first album we, did, we gave them and it was like, oh, the look of horror. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this is the bit, you know, it, it was, oh, jeez. But it, it went to, it ended the charts, which is silly, at number 12 on the mainstream charts. <laughs> it's like, what? You know, and yeah, commercial radio stations were giving it album of the week. It was like, oh, there's something stinky here, really. <laughs> you know, Triple M album of the week. I mean, come on. Jesus, they didn't even look at, they didn't even look at Doughboy Hollow. And if, if ever an album of the week, it was going to be Doughboy Hollow, not Trace. So yeah. it was just a bit stinky, I think. <laughs> In that respect, it's a bit weird how that, those things happen when you're signed to a big label. All of a sudden, you're debuting at number 12 on the ARIA charts. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. It's silly. The last two albums were a real departure from what people knew of, of the band. Mm, Do you we, think we discovered Electronica. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah. Do you think the split may have happened earlier had you not done those albums? Was it one last Probably, try at something yeah. different? I mean, Brett just sort of sort of called me and went, I'm playing a lot of acoustic and I'm fiddling with this. We we purchased, he and I purchased a thing called a groove box, which uh, quite a few years ago, we purchased a groove box which makes all squiggly noises and, you know, sounds and stuff. And uh, then we purchased a little porter studio for ourselves, so we've still got that. So... Um, and that yeah, he was just he just rang me up out of the blue one day and said I don't know whether we've got a, I've got a new, we've got a new album coming or I've gone out of my mind but I the uh, you know I've got all these songs and they're all sort of based around acoustic guitar and electronica. I went oh it sounds very interesting actually. So and that's what it was electronica and basic basically that's where uh, using my guilds as a roadmap was built on acoustic guitar and uh, electronica. Brett didn't play any lead guitar I don't think on the album. Uh, any lead guitar sounds were done by Hoey's keyboards. Any of those sort of guitar type sounds were where we sort of plugged wah pedals into keyboards and we plugged a wah pedal into Robbie's bass and just did all weird things like that. And I thought it was really, I thought, wow, well, we're going in a new direction, this is cool. Hmm. But uh, nobody sort of took much notice. <laughs> what was the feedback from, from long-time fans? Critically, uh, Gil's got a, like, you know, 10 out of 10, and, and uh, critically, it was it was a loved album. It was a very well-received critically, for what it's worth, and, uh, but just the, 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 the CD-buying public weren't really, you know, old fans really weren't, it's not Doughboy Hollow. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like Doughboy Hollow. It's good. They've gone electronic. It's like, no, not really. We're just... Mm, Put a few squiggly sounds behind an acoustic guitar and some nice melodies. It's not not a great departure, and of course, every second band is doing that nowadays. Now, I believe combining electronica and uh, that sort of acoustic sound. I believe you're in you were in the early stages of, of preparing another album just before the split. Yeah, would that have been a continuation of that direction? It was uh, no. <clears throat> I'd I'd uh, I'd stamp my foot. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, well, when we had the studio, basically, yeah, I'm looking at the album now, actually, on the CD that I've, I've got here, at the, uh, the Died Pretty New Songs, it's called, and that's two years old now, 20th of the 12th, 01, where we did all these songs. Wow. And uh, as I said, I, I, I brought it down here to Melbourne because I, these songs have got to see the light of day in some, some, somehow, I don't care how long it takes, I'll get, I'll get them out there. Uh, yeah, this, uh, basically I, we had the studio and I'd go over to Brett's. I was living at Stairmore, at the same suburb as Brett. I'd go around there every weekend to the studio, to our studio. He'd say, come around on a Saturday. I'd take around a little dictaphone where, where during the w- previous week I'd put in all these melodies, vocal melodies and stuff. So I just take them. Or basically, all these new songs are, are my melodies, which we've never written like this before. My melodies, where he's had to follow me. So he's had to build a guitar line around my melodies and, and choruses and stuff. So, and it worked out really well. And um, we did quite a few of these songs. Some were some were fantastic. Some were okay. Um, obviously, but there was just a batch of really strong songs. So I just thought, no, this. And it was harking back to very early sort of free dirt type oh, okay. stuff like uh, the next to nothing ep yeah that sort of very acoustic very soft ballady sort of stuff very ballady sort of um you know type songs um and uh, very yearning type songs i really like them and um we took them to john our manager and he just sort of went i don't think anyone's going to be really interested we know we need to get a publishing deal and blah 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 and nobody's really interested so when we sort of decided to split, I went, Brett said, take these songs and make them a solo project. So that's what I'm hopefully going to do eventually. Oh, excellent. So we will... With Pino experience. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Oh, look, they're just too nice to just sort of throw under a bed or something. They're just, there's just some lovely, lovely, lovely songs. I've been playing them the past week, actually, because as I said, it, the date on them is the 12th, 20th of the 12th, 01. So it's a couple of years now. Yeah. Time flies. It's like it was only yesterday we were doing them, but it's like two years. So, so I want to do that. So it's basically, um, I spoke to a guy called Andrew McCubbin from a band uh, called the uh, Andrew McCubbin and the Hope Addicts, who also plays guitar in Penny Eichinger's band. Oh yeah. And uh, I was sort of, uh, I was at a Penny show the other, the other the other week at the Esplanade Hotel and I was speaking to him and I said would you be interested if I rent these songs past you he's a really good guitarist and he's tall and he looks like Brett's blonde twin <laughs> <laughs> weird isn't it and he said no bring them out to, to my place and we'll have a have a look through them you know I said would you be interested in if I just played basically I need a guitarist to sort mm. of play these songs too and go would you be interested in doing something you know um, the other musicians I can get fairly easily but a guitarist is can you go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need I need somebody good like that. I need another Brett Myers. I think I've got it in Andrew, but uh, I mean that's 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 one thing that I should have gone out there this weekend. But I'm t- uh, one thing about me, I'm very, 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 very lazy. <laughs> Any other person would have had these songs up and out and published and recorded and released and. Uh, but for me, you might hear from me in a, you know, you might hear them a, a, by the end of the year. <laughs> I'm extremely lazy. It's horrible. It's a really horrible trait. Uh, but the solo career is, is definitely uh, a goer. I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, look, I, it's been a year since I've performed now, but, you know, uh, apart from dancing around my lounge room, I've had a few vinos. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> practicing dance steps to these new songs. <laughs> Which is hard because they're all sort of ballads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's uh, you have sort of doubts because you reach a certain age and your hair starts falling out and you go, oh god, <laughs> does anybody really want to come along and witness some old guy with three? Ch- I don't know. It's just <laughs> you know three chins and no hair going waffling on. But I think if you do it gracefully, it can be done. I think. Yeah. Um, I sort of, with all due respects to Jade Hurley, I don't want to end up sort of like that sort of thing. Um, that Jade Hurley sort of doing the old rockin' thing. Um, I don't think there's any danger of that, Ron. I don't think, I hope <laughs> not. You know what I mean? No, like, I, I don't want to be a sad sort of like, you know, uh, you know, apparently Evan Dando was really bad when he came out here. All right. Uh, I was told that he was just like out of his mind. <laughs> just, <laughs> like was doing encores when everyone had left. Oh Everyone was filing out and apparently he came back on and did more encores and the house lights had gone up and 
it was just a shambles. He was talking about his drug rider on in between songs, and everyone just went, "Oh my God, you're kidding!" <laughs> so yeah, you got to be sort of careful. If he can do it gracefully, I think, I hope. Well, Nick Cave seems to have done it okay. Yeah, the yeah. transition. He seems to have done the transition quite admirably and and gracefully, doesn't he? I mean, he's not sort of he's been doing still doing fairly well these days, and he's as old as me. <laughs> You, um, been writing at all since the move to Melbourne? Yes, uh, yeah, I have actually. I've done another project that will hopefully get off the ground. <laughs> I don't know. I've got all these things, but I just don't. Yeah, I just don't follow them through because I get all sort of shy and silly, and then you retreat back into my shell, and you know, go, oh, no, it won't work. I don't want to <laughs> do it now, you know. But um, yeah, Kim Salmon's been coming over. And um, Kim and I are doing uh, some country things. Oh, great. Uh, sort of weird sort of country things, but country things nevertheless. Uh, he wanted to do it and I wanted to do it, so we met up at a Moody show and he said, uh, you know, we mentioned it and he said, I'll come over and he came over. So we have Monday night sessions at my house here at South Yarra. So <laughs> he comes over, he strums and uh, in my lounge room here and... And uh, we've got a, about 12 songs written so far. Excellent. And some of them are really, again, really, really, really good. We've actually, I went over to his place and he's got a little home studio. We actually re- re- recorded four of them. And what I was going to do, I was going to try and get Brad involved too. What I was going to do was have like a, uh, like a country thing with uh, basically country songs. Not country as in sort of... Uh, Lee Kernigan or somebody like that, or with all due respects, not that sort of sort of cut, more sort of Graham Parsons, you know, Flying Burrito Brothers, that sort of old time sort of country, that sort of country with uh, with uh, sort of I was going to send them songs to Brett and get him to put some really subtle electronica behind them, yeah, which might be weird, country and electronic, <laughs> <laughs> just weird, nothing sort of you know doofy or anything, but just this real subtle ambient sort of weird noises behind this sort of country songs. I think that might be interesting. I think if, you, if you're looking for a way to do it gracefully, that there's no age restriction to country music, so I think... Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I think... So I've got a country thing going, which is, as I said, not a hokey country thing. It'll be cool. It'll be a cool country thing. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe this solo thing. Fantastic. So Kim says to think the country thing's my solo thing. I'm going, no, pal. <laughs> this is sort of different. The country thing's not my solo thing. The solo thing is these songs that I've written with I mean Brett and I will still write all these Brett and I get together and write songs but he's just had a new baby so he's pretty busy he and his wife have just had a new baby just before Christmas so yeah he's become a dad so yeah he's uh, he rings me up every week it's just changing all the time <laughs> it's, it's amazing so he's he's way chuffed with that so that's he's sort of taken up time taken up with that for the moment but um, we could always get together and write songs which we always said we would do so I guess we'll just write songs for my solo thing but it's, as I said, it's just getting to know people. I need to know people. I need to know musicians and guitarists and yeah. stuff like that. And just um, and and sort of you get out, I get out and about occasionally, but not as much as I should, I guess. You know, to sort of do that sort of stuff, meet people and stuff. But uh, you know, I don't like to sort of go out that much these days. It's sort of boring. <laughs> <laughs> Curl up by the TV or something. Yeah, real homebody. Yeah, 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 I've become, well, yeah, you get to, a, as I said, you get to a certain age and it's like, oh, God, I don't want to go out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're falling asleep in front of the TV at, you know, quarter to 11 or something, which I've been known to do. <laughs> it's all sad, but it's all nice. Well, Ron, look, I've got to let you go. Thanks so sure. much for your time. Um, enjoy the rest sorry, of the day out on... i boring you with a lot of that stuff. No, nah, it's been fantastic. It's been, it's been um, a... Thank you, John, for, for uh, inviting me along and, uh, and ringing me up and having a chat. It's oh, look. Really nice. Great. Welcome to our city. Thank you very much, John. Mm, it's great to have you here. Yes, thank you. Uh, and if, um, you know, we'll keep in touch. Should I, uh, any of these, either of these things come to some sort of fruition, I'll be in touch and... If that's okay. Oh, absolutely. Please uh, do. I'll just keep you in touch with... Yep. Uh, I've got your email and stuff, and I'll just... Um, I'll keep in touch if do you that. don't mind. Yeah, and I'll do the same to you. I'll let you know when this is going to air and everything fantastic. as well. Good on you. V- fantastic. Thank you so much, John. Thanks a lot, Ron. Take, Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.